Welcome everyone, I'm Leanne Ireland, Marketing Project Manager here at McNaught McKay Electric Company. And I wanted to welcome you to our Industry Expert Exchange on Mechatronics. Every month, a panel of specialists from across our five regions cover a new topic, exploring the latest and greatest technology, developments, and challenges in that focus area. We host these live streams once a month on Thursdays at noon Eastern Standard Time, so you can join us on your lunch break, or you can watch the recording afterwards. As you join, say hello in the comments section. Let us know where you're joining us from today. I'll have my eye on those comments as we go along. Feel free to ask questions in the comments at any time throughout the sessions. There's no need to wait for a Q&A portion at the end, and we'll answer your questions in real time. Now, if you have a question we can't get to today, or if you're watching this as a recording, you can always reach out to us at macandmaclive at mc-mc.com. The email address is in the description of this video, and I'll repeat it again at the end of our session. This month's topic is mechatronics. Before we jump in, let's take a minute to meet our panelists today. I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves. We'll go around the screen. So if you can give us your name, your area of expertise, and where you're joining us from today, that'd be great. Let's start with Tom. Good afternoon. Thank you, Leanne. My name is Tom Joy. I'm an engineering supervisor for Mac and Mac uh, based in Madison Heights, Michigan. I've been here at Mac and Mac for about six years. I am a mechanical engineer by degree. And I had about 12 years in the bearing industry before coming here to Mac and Mac. All right, Randy, go ahead. Hello, my name is Randy Mueller. I am based out of the Mac and Mac Toledo, Ohio branch servicing Northwest Ohio. I'm a systems engineer uh, focusing on mechatronics. And Scott? Uh, hello, my name is Scott Martin and I'm the motion and controls product manager covering the state of Georgia. And last but not least, Gary. Hi, my name is Gary Smith. I am a mechatronics specialist in our Greenville, South Carolina office. Um, I've been with McNaught and McKay for 18 years, but I've been in the industry about 30 years. That's great. Thanks, you guys. So we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen here. So if everyone can just bear with me for one second, and I will get this up. And... And then we're going to, I'm going to start the question. Oops. I'm going to start the question with uh, Scott. Can you, mechatronics is kind of a new term in the industry and, and sometimes it can be confusing. Can you explain to us what that is exactly? Yeah, sure. Um, and appreciate the slide here because you can see there's a lot going on. And that's because mechatronics is really a multifaceted field. It's this um, joining together of different types of engineering, such as like mechanical, computer, you can see controls, electronics, all represented in the interior of the graphic on that diagram in those colored circles. And really it, it combines these uh, in, across a variety of industry segments using modern technologies, things like motion control, robotics, design, including virtual design. And even in the case of Rockwell Automation, also things like um, advanced intelligent transport technology and safety also plays a part of that as well. And really, mechatronics is kind of a recently developed field and it kind of simply started as a means of being able to integrate pieces of mechanical equipment, say like pneumatic or hydraulic cylinders with advancing electronic control systems. So it starts kind of humbly like that, but quickly it's kind of grown now to become what you see here, which is sort of an essential holistic means of enhancing modern manufacturing, but also optimizing machine design. So if you're applying mechatronics and the principles here, you're really doing a couple different things. You're analyzing and production, but you're also looking at things like trying to reduce waste and cost. So this kind of falls in line with what all machine builders are thinking about, right? It's things like 
increasing production rates and profitability. It's also things like improving product quality uh, and precision, machine flexibility. But also on the other hand, it's doing things like it's offering simplifying um, machine design or installations and even things like building intelligence or better diagnostics into a machine, which can help minimize dependency on labor resources. So in summary, what I would say is really the goal of Mechatronics is to identify and manage efficient, smart machine solutions that can improve uh, manufacturing operations. That's sort of the gist of it. And, and how, um, Tom, how are we applying those concepts and technologies to create smarter and more efficient machines? Yeah, and I think, thanks, Dan. I think it's a good definition, Scott. And one thing that's kind of, it's interesting to look back before this concept kind of came into, you know, labeled as mechatronics, and uh, a lot of universities have mechatronics engineering programs now, and so it's certainly a lot more widespread. But historically, you look back and you kind of see, mechanical design and controls design and engineering coming at a, a solution from two totally different sides. And so this, this blending together of all these disciplines, I think has really helped us get a lot further down to those, some of those goals Scott was talking about. And so that the last thing that you had said, Scott, and we all kind of came up with this, you had to try to boil it down. It's probably building smarter machines. And so there's a couple things. Um, if we look at Rockwell Automation that they've introduced here lately, that you know we could just touch on is is trying to get to that goal of building smarter machines. One of those is independent part technology. So Rockwell has a few different products that fall into that bucket. But if you think historically about conveyance, um, you know solutions were kind of limited, non-flexible, uh, always running. And so when we when we talk about independent cart technology, it's a smart conveyance system based on linear motor technology. So every workpiece or tool that you know someone needs to move can be independently controlled at different speeds. Uh, you're only using energy when you need it in that type of system. So it really does that the, the advent of that technology in particular has pushed us a lot further down this road of, of smarter and more efficient machines. Um, and then along with that, that type of technology, uh, there, there's a Rockwell, there's a software called Emulate 3D um, that's been around for a while, but now, especially here in the automotive industry in Michigan now, we're seeing a lot more use out of this emulation software uh, where control entire machines and control systems actually can be modeled and emulated virtually and debugged, and there's a lot that can be done before hardware actually hits the floor. So it's kind of another common theme you'll probably see throughout this discussion is that a lot of a lot of what we try to do with this mechatronics approach is be faster, you know, faster for our customers, um, more efficient in getting machine design built and, and running production. Digital twin, right? That's what you'll hear a lot. Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, that's another common buzzword out there right now, the digital twin virtual commissioning. Yeah, so software is obviously uh, very critical to uh, to what we do and certainly finds its way into this uh, mechatronics wheel. Uh, one of the most important softwares to us is uh, Studio 5000 Logics Designer. So that's the software tool that we use to configure most of our PLCs and servo amplifiers. So inherently, most of the compact logics and control logics processors are basically inherent motion controllers and not just motion controllers, but extremely very high end motion controllers. And what we do with Studio 5000 software is it's one tool for everything. So traditionally back in the day, there may have been one software for a PLC, a separate software for a standalone motion controller, and yet a third software for servo amplifiers. Now we have one tool that does absolutely everything. And when you configure your, your servo drives uh, in your Studio 5000 project, it's actually saved with the project. So that is very powerful in that if you ever have to replace a drive, if you've ever experienced this before, where 
you had a drive, you put a new drive in, the first thing you had to do was find what, uh, what PC had the proper software on it, what was the necessary cable to be able to connect to that drive and your computer. Uh, it was a very, very difficult process, but now today it's very straightforward, very simple. As long as there's an IP address in that drive, everything we're doing is over ethernet IP. You simply turn it on and it automatically downloads and you're ready to go. Uh, but there are also some additional features that kind of demonstrate the power of Studio 5000 and the onboard or embedded uh, motion control capabilities uh, of that system and how it is a powerful motion controller is number one, we can do all the basic stuff. So we can make moves with our servo drives for simple point to point moves. We can do gearing and camming. We can even do multi-axis control for linear and circular interpolation. So very, very high end performance, but we don't always capture every single application. And there are dedicated machines called robots that will address the, the remaining parts of motion control that we're not typically hitting. And Rockwell does this in one of two ways. Uh, one is the way that they've been doing it for years. And that's basically network control of just about every manufacturer's black box robot control. So you name it, pretty much every player out there does have some type of key to get into Studio 5000 or Wojcik's uh, platforms over Ethernet IP, and there's basically handshaking that goes on between the two. But Rockwell has now gone, taken the next step into something they call unified robot control. What unified robot control is, is allows us to use standard Wojcik processors, standard Kinetics hardware, standard view products. And as long as you have a mechanism for a robot, whether it's a Scara robot, a Delta robot, or even an uh, articulated arm robot, we can offer robotic control built into that system. So there's no longer a black box control. It's all easily available and provided hardware that most people are very, very familiar with. So again, it's not a black box solution uh, that you have to worry with. So this is something to, to keep an eye on. This is a developing trend. It's something that uh, we'll definitely see coming more to the forefront uh, in the next few years. Uh, but again, it's all part of that very, very powerful um, robotic control, kinematic control, motion control or capabilities in that system that we already have today. And again, we use kinematics. If you're familiar with robotics, we're basically transforming between joint space and Cartesian coordinates. And again, that's going to allow us to do control of all those different robot types, Cartesian, Delta, Scara, H-bots, T-bots that we might hit on a little bit later, and even the full-blown articulated arm robots. Very cool stuff. Yeah, very awesome. Yeah, so I'd say that unified robotics, right, is within Studio 5000 being one of the newer capabilities um, from Rockwell, but there's definitely a handful of um, things within Studio 5000 that have been around for a little while um, and that we still want to highlight as far as <clears throat> From the motion perspective, getting these getting these servo motors up and running, um, some of the tools there within these integrated motion drives, uh, specifically, right, some of the adaptive tuning features would be one key piece. I know traditionally, um, servo tuning was maybe thought of as a little bit of a dark art, um, <laughs> right? You. Lots of facilities might have that one that one guy that's been there for 30, 40 years, and he just he just knew what to set those uh, PID gains to to uh, <laughs> get the servo system running and operating properly. And so I think that's something that's a little intimidating, especially for some younger engineers stepping in to these roles, um, you know, starting up these machines. And I think that Rockwell's integrated motion um, suite and within Studio 5000, the tools there really make it easier than I think a lot of our customers even know. So I will say that, you know, lots of these newer drives, the 55, 57, 5300 servo drives um, that are designed to be used with the servo motors. So they're out of box settings as far as um, 
gain settings are already pretty well tailored to the motor they're controlling. Um, and lots of things that we'll, we'll recommend to customers, right, are just leaving those out-of-box settings and going through and turning on, there's a couple things called adaptive tuning um, with some tracking notch filters as well as load observer are the two big, big pieces. And so by, by selecting that load observer, basically clicking the box and selecting another couple settings, um, that servo drive is monitoring the reflected inertia back from the load and, and on the fly it's changing those gains. So you might install a machine and after time, right, things start to wear, um, gearing starts to wear down, you get more backlash or tension in belts becomes a little, uh, a little more sloppy. So instead of you having to manually go in and change um, the tuning of your drive right it's now automatically doing that and accounting for those as well as some of the tracking notch filters that you can turn on and automatically right you're reducing resonance so if you've ever started up a, a servo drive and you just hear whining or really bad performance or some jitter right lots of times that's resonance within the mechanics and these drives are really capable and able to actively filter out those resonance frequencies and it really makes um, starting these up a lot easier than I think a lot of people um, even know. Definitely more than more than I knew when I when I started. I was a little a little nervous, and they they make it easy now for the new guys. Yeah, that that's great stuff there, Andy. And it, you know, it kind of brings to mind another enhancement that came out about the last time we saw the uh, latest releases to the adaptive tuning, the enhancements there, and that was a feature called virtual torque sensing. Um, as well, and really what virtual torque sensor does, released at that same time for our newer drives, as you mentioned, our 5000 series, 5300 and 5700 specifically, but the virtual torque sensor actually, it provides an estimate of motor torque without having to have a true physical external sensor. So what it really does is it, it is able, you know, if it sees a manual disturbance out there at the load, you can see uh, that within the system, within logics, and be able to re react immediately to it. So it's really nice because that kind of feature is adding in intelligence. In the old days, we would look at a value called current feedback, which um, was really difficult, right, to, to gain any kind of real accurate, real-time knowledge from because, as we all know, that, that value is very erratic uh, within the system typically. So with the new feature, what's nice about it is we're able to even sense really small disturbances out there at the load. And this can be detected with this torque estimate now uh, within the controller. So it's kind of, it's, it's enabling capabilities on machines, intelligence that wasn't really there or, or capable of previously. Um, and, and the way Rockwell does that is they, they actually help by providing even some sample code. If people are familiar with the sample code website. It's a free website Rockwell offers. Um, they've actually developed an add-on instruction for this, which is really nice. So you can go out there and, um, oh, it's going to, no, uh, condition monitoring for a motion access. That's what you can type into the field there. And uh, it'll actually bring up this AOI, which you can drop into your program. And like I said, it, it kind of brings in some new intelligence and ideas for being able to um, fortify a machine in terms of doing things with applications that weren't previously available. Things like perhaps um, detecting product jams uh, that much sooner, being able to react because that AOI allows you basically to store what a normal, the torque would be on a normal machine cycle. And you could use that to compare what's actually happening during dynamic operation and any deviation between what uh, existed there and what's actually happening could be used to quickly detect some type of product jam. So you know, that's one example. Another might be, um, you mentioned about like belt tensioning and things like that as well, that if you had this stored torque profile and someone had to, you know, for instance, go out and replace a broken chain or a broken timing belt on a machine, they could go out there and adjust um, the tension accordingly to make sure that it's gonna match of the tension of the original belt. So, you know, you can kind of extrapolate that again, this intelligence out across a lot of different um, uh, diagnostics across mechanical issues, right? So things like damaged bearings or um, degradation in a gearbox, perchance, or 
some type of wear and tear on a ball screw or even like a broken or worn rotary knife would all give you some type of deviation in that expected torque value. Uh, again, kind of building a lot of uh, intelligence with just this kind of simple additional feature. It all ties back right to that industry 4.0 and just getting more analytics back from the machine level or component level. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's, and then even on top of that, um, in the, oh, go ahead, Randy, I guess, if you're going to hit most analyzer. No, you, you can go ahead and touch on a little bit more on that. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep building on that thought because you, it, it, there is a lot we can do in software now. And then even on top of that, if, you know, if you talk about in, Industry 4.0 or the Internet of Things, and look from, again, from a mechatronic standpoint, right? So we can blend what's there in software and hardware. Now there's a lot of sensors that have hit the market that can monitor on you know, a motor, vibration, temperature, current, draw. Um, and there, there's a lot of really sophisticated stuff out there. Like you mentioned it, Scott, but a lot of these sensors on a motor now can even pick up which race of which bearing is, you know, maybe starting to go bad. So we can get really far ahead of, um, from that standpoint, ahead of machine failures or downtime and, and start to tell you, you know, either on the machine, on a warning light, on the HMI, on your cell phone, if you want to push there, hey, something's changing in this machine you know you should take a look at this bearing or that gearbox and so that's um you know a lot of these things do kind of tie together in this idea of, of we can we can help make these machines really smart now to, to increase uptime and efficiency and all that kind of good stuff it's even a step further tom you know they talked about predictive maintenance and now they're, they're transitioning to prescriptive maintenance right so it's not just the detecting when something might possibly go, but what the resolution is and automatically ordering replacement parts and scheduling yeah. machine downtime all proactively. Yeah, so I think that that ties a lot into right once you've got your machine um, built, installed and running, getting getting those analytics and feedback, but to kind of jump to the front end of that right and a lot of what we do every day is. Um, the product selection, right, and the initial sizing. So some exciting uh, new software from, from Rockwell being a uh, factory talk motion analyzer. So those that are familiar with uh, Rockwell motion control or maybe have tinkered with some sizing on their own, probably familiar with um, some previous iterations of motion analyzer. I think that was probably, oh, how long ago now, guys, did it go from desktop to online? Was that maybe six, seven years ago? Two, maybe even further back. Um, yeah, even further back. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think, I, think those, <laughs> I think those that were comfortable with the uh, original desktop based motion analyzer probably have um, plenty of thoughts, some good, some bad with the uh, what we've had with the online motion analyzer. There's definitely some good, good features there. Um, but th this is something that we use every day uh, as far as sizing our components. You know, it's it's from start to finish, right? Our customers will give us application requirements, how fast this needs to move or spin, um, you know, how heavy these parts are, duty cycles. We take that information, uh, plug it into Motion Analyzer, and, here, you know, definitely there's more information out there. I think Gary Smith actually has a full-blown virtual lunch and learn up on our site, so I'm going to give him a little plug there using Motion Analyzer. Yeah in detail so that's a good one he'll cover it in a lot more detail than this but um the now we have basically a desktop based factory talk motion analyzer again i believe this is released within the past month or maybe two months um that brought in i think combined a lot of the features um between the two so some things are um some some i think complaints about some of the cloud-based motion analyzer was, you know, you, you were, it, it was, it was on a server. So some of the results took a little bit of time. You'd get hung up a little bit. So this will return results quite a bit quicker when you're doing broad searches for motors, drives, gear ratios. Um, it's a kind of a whole new workflow. So you can kind of see it's really, really nice to click through and they're going to, you know, continue to update this, but there are some features that it brought in from the old desktop, such as 
the um, inertia calculator features and, and kind of storing that input information that you put in there. Some, some things that if you use the tool, and we do encourage um, our customers and those that, that do want to take that next step, it's a very helpful tool from a motion sizing standpoint. We're happy to, to help with that. But if you're familiar with it, there are definitely some, some useful pieces that have been polished up a bit, and we're really excited to see where, where this goes. And that's a free software too, just to just to point that out. And it's Absolutely. extremely powerful just about telling you about your application. So it's not just to size a drive and motor, but we'll tell you every detail about every part of the drive chain, uh, drive train, showing you exactly what the output torque is of, of a gearbox, uh, for example, or the rotational speed of a ball screw to determine that there's not excessive whip. So you can learn all kinds of information about your application. And the best thing is, is like Tom said, it's free. And yeah, it brings along real peace of mind, doesn't it, to be able to model it before selecting components. So absolutely. absolutely. This is this is exactly where we're jumping when when you guys ask us, right? Oh, if we move to this inside gearbox or if we change this ratio. Is that going to be fine? We're going to jump right into motion analyzer, go to that point of the transmission and say, is, you know, is this output torque? What is the rating here? Is the speed okay? Are we still going to be within the ratings of the frame size as a whole? So it's what we use every day. So besides the new motion analyzer tool, what else are you guys seeing? What are, what, what are some of the issues? Um, that you're seeing in the industry and that you're facing on a daily basis. There's one, there's one uh, obvious one out there these days, unfortunately, which of course is supply chain issues that everybody's dealing with. Um, there it is. <laughs> Only matter of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised we made it this long. <laughs> we're, we're certainly not immune. Um, and so, again, you know. One, so when we talk about mechatronics engineering, it's, we're not just talking about component delivery. We already hit on a lot of the software and some of those those aspects of it. But uh, when we look at even when we look at mechanical engineering, one of the things we can do that you know, we help customers with every day is again try to move quickly through the design phase of a machine. And so really, that we I'll always we we'll always talk about the mechatronics approach. I'll always argue down deep somewhere in my heart that like mechanical engineering has got to come first and you got to get that right first because you know, the machine design starts with loads and speeds and cycle time and as soon as we understand how a machine needs to perform and we can use some of the same tools we just talked about but look closely at mechanical design so when you have to understand uh, critical speed Gary just mentioned the L10 life of all your wear components safety factors so you kind of look at every component in a machine and and look at the mechanical aspect of it, make sure that stuff sized properly. Um, we try to get you know these reports, CAD models, all the things that our customers need to take that information and put it into a machine design quickly. So cover that mechanical aspect of it kind of first, but but again, all you know, always with the, the bigger picture and the controls architecture in mind. Gary, are you seeing anything with uh, controls and startup? Absolutely. Like Tom just uh, started out by saying that, you know, uh, lead time issues of the hardware is just one small component of somebody being able to deliver an optimized machine. So uh, we can certainly help in other areas as well, as far as once the hardware is available, minimizing that time that it takes to go ahead and get everything installed and started up, run off and ready to deliver. That, that's a very uh, critical component. And if you are a customer and you're listening and you're not really familiar with the integrated motion message from Rockwell, I strongly uh, encourage you to get in touch with uh, your local Rockwell distributor to kind of see a demonstration of this because a couple of the features I'm gonna mention, we're really only hitting high level um, areas of where you can really see the value of this. Uh, just for example, the being 
the ability of when you're configuring a servo drive in Studio 5000 to be able to do everything by model number. So there's no obscure codes or anything like that. You actually pick the part number off of the servo amplifier. You pick the part number off of the motor and everything pre-populates for you. You're ready to go. Above and beyond that, hopefully you're working with your distributor on a mechanical solution as well, whether it's ball screws or rack and pinions or gearboxes and so on, to enable you to set up your moves and your profiles, everything in Studio 5000 for your moves. You just need to populate a few screens and we can provide that information for you. What is the gear ratio? What is the weight of the ball screw? What is the pitch circle diameter of the pinion that you're using? And then you tell us what units you want, whether it's millimeters, uh, inches, degrees, whatever it happens to be, and that is automatically done for you. So no hand calculations whatsoever. And then we have the other features that that uh, Randy and Scott had talked about before, like the, the load observer settings and virtual torque sensor that just make things much, much easier on the machine, makes it really easy to start up. And then when you're ready to actually do the, the programming itself, Studio 5000 has over 40 different motion instructions that are already pre-populated for you. So it's basically just pointing and clicking on what you want for those different areas. Most people program in ladder logic, but we do support other programming languages as well. Uh, but there's, for example, one block for turning a servo on, a, a different wrong would turn it off, a different one for jog, move, fault reset, and so on. So it's really, really straightforward, really simple type control. And then once you get everything running, you think that the, the way it's supposed to be, if you want to verify that performance to give some type of quantification, we have literally hundreds of tags that are automatically generated when you populate your Studio 5000 projects with that drive part number. So looking at actual position, actual velocity, and so on. And then you can use trending which also built into Studio 5000. So you can see exactly what's happening in your application to make sure it conforms to what we said the sizing results should be and make sure it's going to meet cycle time and do everything else that you need it to do. And then above and beyond that, what we like to do is we like to be uh, an, an auxiliary engineering resource for a lot of our customers and provide them with a single point of responsibility. So not only are you looking to one person to make sure everything is going to work and there's not going to be a lot of finger pointing, the time savings is phenomenal because if you think that you can piece and part together a solution and save money, we have found, most of our customers have found that that is not really beneficial, especially if you have to work with one manufacturer of one component and every time that they make a change, every other supplier has to go back and evaluate and determine whether they have to make changes to the motor, the gearbox, the ball screw, linear guidance, whatever it happens to be. So that process uh, can take a lot of time. And there's even a, an improvement above and beyond that, just having us look at it. And I'm gonna let uh, Randy speak to that, but it's looking at basically a pre-configured solution. Yeah, there's a good example of one showing up on the screen of a kind of a complete system all put together as a single piece. Yeah, I think Tom and Gary, do you want to touch on this one? And I'm going to go ahead and take that piece. Yeah, we can do that. I think um, there were a couple, just a couple other, I guess, interesting and unique product types that we work with out there. This is showing um, basically a multi-axis. This looks like two, they, they can do them in three axes as well. Uh, basically Cartesian gantry robot. So there's some unique features of this um, in the way that the, the axes actually move and coordinate with each other. And I think Gary, you mentioned it early on, some of the uh, kind of the pre-built instruction blocks to handle this HBOT. This is an HBOT or TBOT, commonly called types of motions. Um, so it's just a good example of, of in, instead of having to look at every individual part and piece and source those differently and, and put them all together on your floor, basically, you know, we, we have access to solutions and 
and products like this that are more of a complete system. Right, and it's not, if you looked at doing that as an individual design, if you look at all the different parts and pieces there with the extrusions and the belts, every single piece that you see on there is provided with that solution. So the the cat track, the gearboxes, the torque tubes, which allow the, the torque to be shared across uh, members there, um, all the hardware to do the uh, assembly and basically provide a rigid structure. And even above that, if you wanted to put this onto some type of frame, uh, we can provide that as well. But the amount of time savings is just absolutely phenomenal when you look at, you know, a, a pre-engineered solution like this. And, and as you mentioned, Tom, we also do, you know, the third axis on this as well. You can do XX prime, Y, Y prime, you know, Z axes, and then the H bots and the, the T bots. There's just a, a multitude of different ways that you can configure these products. Yeah, there are. And and I'm, I think there's a few out there. The, these ones are, this is from a company called Macron Dynamics that, that a lot of us have worked uh, closely with over the years on solutions like this. Um, you can certainly check out their website. Randy, I think you wanted to hit a little more on, on optimizing different parts and pieces of a solution. Yeah, I want to circle back to what Gary was saying as far as the benefit of uh, single point of contact. And I think that really is one of our biggest value adds and what, what you gain from working with Mac and Mac's mechatronic team, right? Is as that single point of contact, as you see changes in your design, and especially now with um, lead time and supply chain concerns, right? Changes are being made every day. We're, we're doing this every single day. A single component changes. And so whether that be a drive motor, or one of the mechanical pieces changes. Having, you know, myself um, or any one of our team members kind of orchestrating and then being able to walk through and say, okay, what else needs to change? So like a specific example, and I'm sure everyone has dealt with this, but something literally last week, right? I had a customer that had a really long drive lead time. They couldn't, they couldn't, um, they couldn't do with the lead time. And so they asked what other options we had. We were able to determine that the drive they were initially looking at was probably a little more than what they needed as far as features and we were able to go with a different family of drives one that was much more readily available now the change that that followed that was that the motor that was originally specified for this job because i think this was a repeat order um so they were just going to buy everything that they bought before but the motor that was being used is no longer compatible with this uh, with this drive family that we had to select. So I was able to select a different family of motor, one that was compatible, but then you need to look at, oh, this was then coupling to a gearbox. So I was able to work with the gearbox manufacturer. Um, actually, we had to change the ratio because the torque specs were a little different um, on the motor. So we needed a little more torque and we didn't need um, all the speed that we had on the other one. So we changed the ratio a little bit. We made sure that the input adapter on the gearbox was now sized properly for the new motor. And then I was also able to ensure, right, that we stayed in the same frame size of gearbox so that the mounting to the linear actuator that they had already purchased didn't need to change. And there's just stuff like that, that it can be a lot to keep track of and try to coordinate, especially as you're working with multiple um, suppliers and vendors. And that's just something that we that we do every day. We know that it's We know that it's a pain and that it's, we're, we're trying to we're trying to do the best that we can with availability that we have right now. So I think that's just one of our big, big value adds that I want to emphasize. Yeah, I mean, great example. And, you know, even uh, looking outside, you know, the supply chain issues, component selection, I just wanted to add in that, you know, another challenge that we're kind of facing in our area and seeing is that customers are, are really being driven to continue to find energy savings. Uh, as well with their machines. So they're always investigating um, alternatives to things like fluid power uh, within their facilities. So, you know, the majority like of total cost of ownership for fluid power, people are realizing now it's pretty evident that it's not in the purchase price of the components and things themselves, right? But it's in the day-to-day -day operation 
uh, and maintenance of those systems. So customers continue to contact us to look for ways to reduce costs and maintenance by eliminating things like HPUs, air compressors, filters, plumbing, all those things that kind of go along with a, a fluid power system. So we're, we're constantly um, in discussions with people who are looking to convert pneumatic or hydraulic actuators over to an electromechanical solution. And the reason for that is, in a lot of cases, those advantages are, are pretty evident. And probably the main one is that energy efficiency, that cost-effective operation that you get with an electric cylinder, where you're really only demanding or utilizing energy during actual operation of a move. Right, so that's a big difference from what we see with fluid power is you walk around these plants and constantly hear the compressors working overtime, right, to keep pressure on a system and maintain position. So with, with these electrical type solutions, you know, there's no costly and messy leaks, you get smooth operation. And probably the, the other thing that really jumps out above the energy efficiency is you get really precise control of the movement too, which is a real advantage for people out there. So you can much better control things like the speeds, the acceleration for smoother starts and stops. Um, and even when it comes to fluid power, right, it's typically all or nothing, right? Extend or retract uh, for your stroke. If you need to do any type of multi-point positioning, well, that's a, a little difficult to do with a fluid power cylinder. So um, it's so much easier with an electric or electromechanical solution. And all it kind of really adds up to is not just the, the cost effectiveness, but uh, better machine flexibility as well. So, and, and I appreciate, um, yeah, we brought up this uh, particular slide here where I, I really wasn't going to speak towards any specific type of component when it comes to this, because uh, I'll plug myself, I guess, because my virtual lunch and learn last year was literally on servo linear uh, options and solutions. So it's still on our YouTube channel there. And it does go into the different products and, and what we offer in that regard. But there is one specific product um, that we want to show with this particular slide here, because um, this is, and I'll name the manufacturer, is a Kintronics SHA actuator. And the reason I'm showing it is because it's really a, a unique design. And this is something that's created a lot and generated a lot of buzz you know, during our discussions down here, because really what you're looking at here is a closed system that's a hybrid of servo and hydraulics. So it's really kind of an efficient method of being able to employ a rod style type of actuator on a system um, where you need to supply higher forces than perhaps an electric cylinder can generate. So what's neat about it is the power transmission itself, the method is hydraulic, but it's all self-contained within that unit. So what we're actually seeing here in this picture is uh, a servo motor, just like a standard servo motor we would sell, coupled to a bi-directional positive displacement pump and manifold. So all of this kind of together eliminates that need for that remote uh, HPU, right? That hydraulic power unit taking up space on your floor. There's no hoses, right? No threaded connections out there to have to deal with. So a very, very compact solution. And it can be really very viable for customers out there who are looking for um, alternatives to uh, standard hydraulics. So uh, in the interest of time, this is really all I kind of wanted to show on this. But uh, again, um, we're having a lot of discussions in our area about being able to apply these components right at the point of actuation. It, it, with that, with that right. particular product too, Scott, you also get a huge advantage over traditional uh, ball screw or, or roller screw type of actuators in that there's really no wear, so no no limited lifetime or damage to the screw from really high press loads. So this is, this is a really unique blend of two technologies. And the flexibility is phenomenal too. We're showing it with like a right angle uh, configuration there, but the motor can be in line or reverse parallel. Uh, even T-shaped, uh, wherever you can fit the motor in. So, like I said, lots of flexibility too. Yeah, you guys, um, 
The last thing I think we wanted to talk about was um, our website and um, and how how much information that we do have on that. I'm going to drop the link in the comments um, for anybody that is interested in that. Um, but uh, does anybody want to talk to the to the slide that just shows what the mechatronics is on there? The website. Yeah, it, I think um, it's a hard topic to, you know, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, obviously, it's a hard topic to cover in 45 minutes here, but hopefully we talked about some different and interesting aspects of mechatronics. And if you share the link there, Leanne, on our website, uh, macmac.com, there's some more detail on, on, you know, you can see the three categories there. So we talk a little bit about drives and motion hardware and software. And then mechanical components too, um, and I know down below on the actual website is is kind of a list of all, all the all the different vendors and suppliers we work with. So there's a lot of good info up there on our website. Uh, Let me see if I can. I should be able to pull up the actual site, and we can take a look at that. Um, so you can talk about that. Can you guys all see that now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. So, like you were saying, go ahead, um, Tom, you were talking about. Yeah, if you can scroll to the bottom there. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of our uh, our vendors and partners that we work with. And, and some of those may be different in different regions for McNaught and McKay, but any of us are always available, you know, to inquire about products or help answer questions or, or just talk through machine design and different concepts and different components. And I think up above, there are there's if you click through either of those three uh, kind of categories drives motion or mechanical there's more information on some of the products and services we can offer so. that's great yeah I, I think it's uh those are all the main topics we kind of wanted to hit today were there any questions out there i do not see any right this second. Hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing and flip back over here. We were that thorough. <laughs> These were so good. <laughs> but again, we're on a delay, but <laughs> <laughs> I think we're almost out of time. Um but if you didn't get to a question that you had today um, and or you're watching uh, on the recording, you can always reach out to us at Mac and Mac Live at nc-mc.com. And that email address is in the video description. Uh, I want to thank our panelists today, Tom Joy, Randy Mueller, Gary Smith, and Scott Martin. You guys gave us a lot of information to think about. And I, I just mechatronics is huge. And, and I know I learned a lot today. I hope everyone else did as well. Uh, if you're watching and you haven't already subscribed to the McNaught McKay YouTube channel uh, for more industry content like this, please go ahead and, and do that now. Um, we'll see you all live again next month on Thursday, October 27th, when our topic will be networking. Um, thank you everyone so much and uh, we will see you again next month. Thank you. Thank you.